Life in my Michigan cabin had always been a tranquil experience, a deliberate withdrawal from the chaos of modern existence. Nestled deep in the woods, it was a place where time seemed to pause, where the relentless chatter of society was replaced by the hum of the wind and the chattering of woodland creatures. But that serenity would eventually give way to a series of disturbing events, events that would chip away at my skepticism and introduce me to a very real local legend, the Dogman. It all began on a crisp autumn evening. The leaves had turned a myriad of oranges and reds, and the air carried a fresh, earthy scent. I was chopping wood near my shed when I heard it. A low growl, different from the usual sounds that the forest animals made. It was guttural and strangely menacing. I paused, axe in hand, scanning the tree line for the source. But there was nothing, just the fading light casting long, haunting shadows. Over the next few weeks, odd occurrences started to disrupt the quietude of my life. I would wake up to find things outside my cabin moved or knocked over, my firewood scattered, my trash cans toppled, and most unsettlingly, claw marks on the trees surrounding my property. These were no ordinary marks. They were far too large and deliberate, not like anything that a deer or even a bear would make. The tension escalated one night when the growling returned. It was louder this time, closer, accompanied by heavy footsteps that circled my cabin. I sat in the darkness, clutching a hunting rifle, peering nervously through my curtains at the ominous void beyond the glass. Then I saw the eyes, two yellow orbs glowing in the dark staring directly at me. My heart pounded in my chest as a figure emerged from the shadows, tall and bipedal, covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was a nightmarish blend of man and wolf, and in that chilling moment, I knew I was face to face with the dog man. Our eyes locked and the creature let out a haunting howl that echoed through the forest, filling the air with a palpable sense of dread. I raised my rifle, my hands shaking, but the creature seemed to sense my intention and vanished into the woods, its growl fading into the distance, but its presence lingering like an unspoken threat. Days turned into weeks and the incidents around my cabin continued, yet I couldn't bring myself to leave. This was my home and I would not be driven out by fear. But I took precautions, installing heavy duty locks and reinforcing my windows always keeping my rifle within arm's reach. Then came the night that would forever alter my understanding of the world. A powerful storm was rolling in, the wind howling like a chorus of anguished souls, the trees swaying violently in the tempest. It was the perfect backdrop for the dog man's return, and return it did. The creature appeared at my window, its eyes glowing even brighter against the stormy darkness its snarl sending a chill down my spine. But this time I was ready. I grabbed my rifle, aimed at those menacing eyes, and fired. The bullet shattered the window and hit its mark, but the creature let out a howl, not of pain, but of anger, of indignation. It backed away, its eyes locked onto mine for one last moment before disappearing into the tempest leaving me with a shattered window and a shattered worldview. I spent the rest of that stormy night in a state of heightened alert, rifle in hand, grappling with the surreal reality of my situation. I had faced the Dogman, a creature of local legend and frightening reality, and had come away with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lurk in the Michigan woods. The experiences around my cabin have since quieted down but the sense of unease remains. I've shared my story with a few close friends who have met it with a mixture of skepticism and intrigued concern. And while I don't know if the dog man will ever return, I continue to live here in my secluded Michigan cabin, forever aware that some legends are grounded in truths too unsettling to dismiss, lurking in the shadows of both our world and our imagination.
In the heart of Michigan, where the dense woods serve as a living canvas of ever-changing foliage and elusive wildlife, locals often whisper tales of a creature known only as the Dogman. Half man, half wolf, it is a legend that strikes both curiosity and dread into the hearts of those who venture into the wilderness. As for me, a woman with a passion for the great outdoors and a healthy skepticism of local myths, I would soon find myself entangled in the fabric of this tale. Equipped with a trusty tent, camping gear, and my loyal German Shepherd Max, I set off for a weekend retreat in the Manistee National Forest. The drive was peaceful, the hum of the engine accompanied by the melodic serenade of birdsong filtering through the open windows. By late afternoon, I found the perfect spot, a clearing by a serene lake, hidden from the world by a curtain of trees and towering pines. After pitching my tent and building a campfire, I sat by the lake, losing myself in the reflections of the twilight sky on the water. Max, ever vigilant, stood by my side, his eyes scanning the surroundings, as if he sensed something that I couldn't. I laughed off his behavior, tossing a stick for him to fetch, and snapping some pictures with my camera. The first inkling that something was amiss came as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of indigo and obsidian. An eerie howl echoed through the trees, a sound that seemed neither fully animal nor human. Max growled low in his throat, his body tense, eyes fixed on the darkening woods. Unsettled but not yet afraid, I decided to retreat to the safety of my tent. With Max beside me, I zipped it, tucking myself into my sleeping bag while leaving my flashlight and pocket knife within arm's reach, just in case. In the dead of night, I was awakened by the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, and heavy. Max's low growl filled the tent as he bared his teeth, staring at the fabric walls as if he could see through it. My heart pounding, I grabbed my flashlight and pocket knife and unzipped the tent cautiously, my hands shaking with a mixture of cold and fear. What I saw in that moment will haunt me forever. Bathed in the pale light of my flashlight was a creature standing on two legs, its body covered in dark fur, its eyes glowing an unnatural yellow. It was the Dog Man, the living, breathing embodiment of Michigan's most unsettling legend. Our eyes met and a chill ran down my spine. It wasn't just the appearance of the creature that frightened me, it was the intelligence I saw in its eyes, a malevolent cunning that hinted at something far more terrifying than any wild animal. Before I could react, Max lunged at the creature, snapping and growling with a ferocity I'd never seen in him. The dog man let out a snarl of frustration, or perhaps surprise, and for a moment, just a moment, it seemed to reconsider. It was that momentary distraction that gave me the chance to act. I shouted loudly, my voice tinged with desperation, and hurled my pocket knife at the creature. Miraculously, it hit its mark, and the dog man let out a low howl of pain, or perhaps anger, retreating into the dark depths of the forest. I quickly grabbed Max, zipped up my tent, and sat there, trembling in the silence that followed, a silence that felt like the world holding its breath. When dawn finally broke, I packed up my camp as quickly as I could, leaving behind the tranquility of the lake for the harsh reality of the known world. I never reported my encounter, but I also never returned to those woods. The experience forever changed me, shattering my skepticism and leaving me with an unshakable respect for the stories and legends that shape our understanding of the wilderness. The Michigan woods are a place of beauty, but they are also a realm where myths walk on four legs, or sometimes two, and where the line between the natural and the supernatural is eternally blurred.
I had always considered myself a rational person, until I spent a semester studying in Coyoacan, Mexico City. A neighborhood steeped in history and culture, Coyoacan had been the stage for many significant events, including the lives of Diego Rivera and Frido Kahlo. Yet it wasn't the artistic heritage that captivated me. It was the local legend of Los Monmullos, the whispering walls. The tale goes like this. Many years ago, a powerful alchemist was rumored to have lived in a secluded mansion in Coyoacan. His name has been forgotten, but locals claim that his spirit still resides within the walls of a particular house near the Plaza Hidalgo. These walls, they say, whisper secrets and prophecies to those who dare listen. Intrigued by the myth, I decided to delve deeper. It didn't take long to identify the mansion in question, an imposing yet dilapidated structure that was currently serving as an antique store. The owner, Senora Martinez, was a kind elderly woman who had heard the whispers herself. But you must visit at dusk, she warned. That's when the walls are most talkative. Armed with curiosity and a dash of skepticism, I returned to the mansion later that evening. The sun had just dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the cobblestone streets. As I entered the building, a sudden shiver ran down my spine. The atmosphere felt dense, almost as if it were charged with static electricity. Following Senora Martinez's instructions, I approached the oldest part of the mansion, a small chamber filled with dusty books and ancient artifacts. There, I stood silently, my ears straining to catch any sound. At first, there was nothing. Then, gradually, I began to hear a soft murmur. It was almost as if the walls themselves were whispering in hushed tones. I couldn't make out distinct words, but the timber of the voices struck me. They carried an unexplainable weight, like a sorrowful lament or a prayer. Just then, a stronger voice broke through, clear and resonant. Ayuda, it said. Help. My heart pounded as I looked around, but the room was empty. It was unmistakably the wall that had spoken. In the following days, I couldn't shake the encounter from my mind. Consumed by the need to understand, I began researching more about the alchemist and the history of the mansion. To my surprise, I stumbled upon old documents, revealing that the alchemist had been a benevolent man, providing remedies to the sick during a plague that had swept through Cuyoacan. He had died under mysterious circumstances, and many believed that he had been betrayed by a close friend. Emboldened by this knowledge, I returned to the mansion. This time, the whispers seemed to acknowledge my presence, their murmurs turning into what sounded like a soft, appreciative sigh. As I left, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace, as if a weight had been lifted from the room. That encounter forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that some mysteries are beyond rational explanation. The whispering walls of Coyoacan became a long-lasting mystery to me, a whispered legend that I was fortunate enough to hear, adding another layer to the rich background of local folklore. And so, every time I pass by that ancient mansion, I offer a nod of respect. After all, who am I to argue with the walls that speak, in a city where the boundary between legend and reality often blurs? leaving only awe in its wake. When I took a teaching job in Guanajuato, I was enthralled by the city's rich history, colorful streets, and the maze-like tunnels that snake beneath the surface. However, I was not prepared for the legend of La Luz de Guanajuato, or the Light of Guanajuato. 
locals often spoke of an ethereal light that sometimes appeared in the city's old cemeteries and narrow alleys, guiding lost souls or leading others astray. It was said to be the manifestation of the tormented souls who perished during the time of the wars or during the Spanish Inquisition. I took these stories with a grain of salt until my colleague Mariana invited me to an All Souls Day gathering at her family's home. The night began with a visit to the Panteon Antiguo, one of the oldest cemeteries in the city, to pay respects to her ancestors. We light candles not just to remember the departed, but to guide their souls and ours through the darkness, Mariana explained. After the visit, we walked through a dimly lit alley to reach her home. That's when I saw it, a soft golden light hovering a few feet above the ground. It was different from the flickering glow of the candles we had just lit. This light seemed alive, pulsating gently in the night air. The Luz de Guanajuato, Mariana whispered, her eyes widening. Quick, make a wish, but don't speak it aloud. I closed my eyes, half in disbelief, and made a wish. When I opened them, the light had vanished. We continued our walk in silence, each absorbed in our own thoughts. Mariana broke the quiet by saying, You know, they say that if La Luz appears to you, it means you have an unresolved matter that needs attention. Her words struck a chord. I had been grappling with the decision to extend my teaching contract or return to my home country to take care of my ailing father. Seeing the light of Guanajuato felt like a nudge from the universe urging me to confront the issue I'd been avoiding. The next morning, I called my father. Our heartfelt conversation revealed that he was more understanding of my situation than I had given him credit for. His words dispelled my guilt, and I decided to extend my stay in Guanajuato. Weeks later, I visited the Panteon Antiguo again, this time alone. I lit a candle and whispered a prayer of gratitude half hoping to see La Luz once more. While the mysterious light did not appear, the feeling of relief and direction it had given me was palpable. That experience became a defining moment of my time in Guanajuato, a mystical encounter that lent clarity to my earthly dilemmas. Whether it was a figment of local folklore or a true spectral phenomenon didn't really matter. What did matter was that it guided me much like the many stories and legends that have guided the people of this enchanting city through centuries of darkness and light. Eastbrook, a quaint town tucked away in Maine, has always intrigued me with its rich lore and the tales of the enigmatic Eastbrook Harpy. According to local folklore, this cryptid is a blend of woman and bird, with the ability to emit a wail that freezes even the bravest hearts. I decided to venture into the main woods, armed with a camera, a voice recorder, and a compass, determined to unravel the truth behind the Harpy myth. The woods exuded a mystical atmosphere. Old growth trees loomed high above their branches, woven into intricate patterns that seemed to obscure the sky. The forest floor was a quiet orchestra of rustling leaves and hidden life. Despite the picturesque setting, a sense of foreboding seeped through, as though the forest itself was warning me of what lay ahead. It wasn't long before I reached a clearing, believed by locals to be a hot spot for harpy sightings. With bated breath and beating heart, I set up my makeshift base, placing the voice recorder in the middle of the clearing and setting the camera to capture any movement. Is anyone here? I asked into the void, my voice somehow managing to pierce the heavy silence. Nothing just the whispering wind and the distant hoot of an owl. 
If you are the Eastbrook Carpy, can you give me a sign? And then it happened. A scream unlike any I had ever heard ripped through the forest air. A melding of human agony and avian screech. My camera trembled in my hands as I aimed it toward the source of the sound. For a brief moment, I saw it. A figure, half woman, half bird, perched atop a tree. Its eyes glowed a fierce yellow, and a spread of feathers framed its form. The entity took flight, disappearing into the canopy of trees, but not before it left me with a sense of existential dread, a reminder of my fragility in a world filled with unknowns. I collected my equipment, my hands shaking, and made my way out of the woods, each step weighed down by the energy of what I had just experienced. As I reviewed the footage days later, I found that the camera had malfunctioned at the critical moment, turning my tangible evidence into nothing more than a personal anecdote tinged with the supernatural. I've never returned to those woods, but the experience lingers like a haunting melody, a brush with an entity or a legend that refused to be captured, but left its mark nonetheless. Whether the Eastbrook Carpy is real or just a figment of collective imagination, I can't say. What I do know is that some mysteries are woven so deeply into the fabric of a place that they become inseparable from it, part of the pulse that makes each leaf quiver and every shadow dance. And sometimes, those mysteries find a way to reveal themselves, if only for a fleeting moment, in ways that leave us questioning the boundaries of what we consider to be real. Hiking the Appalachian Trail had been my dream for as long as I could remember. The stretch that passes through Maine was said to be both the most beautiful and the most challenging, so I saved it for last. With my trusty backpack and hiking boots, I set off, my heart filled with excitement and a little bit of dread. I made good progress the first day covering a significant distance as the dense main woods wrapped around me like an emerald embrace. It was during the second day that I stumbled upon the strange artifact, an odd shaped rock with mysterious carvings, half buried in the ground. I didn't recognize the symbols, but they fascinated me enough to keep it as a keepsake. By nightfall of the third day, I began hearing them, the footsteps, soft but deliberate, keeping pace with me but always remaining unseen. I told myself it was just an animal, but I knew better. The footprints I found the next morning confirmed it. They were human, but much larger, almost unnaturally so. That's when I remembered an old Maine legend about the specter moose, an albino moose that was not just an animal, but a spirit of the forest. It was said to appear in times of great change, a harbinger of things to come. On the fourth night, I saw it. Under the moonlight, the specter moose revealed itself. It was an incredible sight, larger than any moose I had ever seen, its white fur almost glowing in the dark. But what struck me the most were its eyes. They looked almost human, filled with a wisdom that seemed to transcend time. It gestured with its head, as if inviting me to follow. I hesitated, but then thought of the artifact in my pocket. Could it be related? Compelled to find out, I followed the specter moose deeper into the woods. It led me to a clearing where the moonlight revealed another set of carvings, similar to the ones on the artifact. It was a story depicting coexistence between humans and the forest, and a warning against disrupting the natural balance. As I touched the carvings, the artifact in my pocket seemed to resonate, 
vibrating gently as if to acknowledge its twin. The specter moose looked at me one last time, its gaze almost approving, before vanishing into the forest. I resumed my hike the next day, but something had changed. The trail was the same, the challenge as demanding as ever, but I was different. I had walked into the woods as a lone hiker, chasing a dream. I walked out with the weight of revelation that we're all part of a larger, connected system, forever bound by the stories that shape us. I left the artifact back where I found it, deciding that some things are better left untouched, their mysteries free to captivate the next wanderer brave enough to venture into the deep main woods. In the vast wilderness of Maine, home to ancient forests and sprawling lakes, there exists a legend that has fascinated adventurers and locals alike for generations. The legend of Pomola. Said to be a creature with the body of a man, the head of a moose, and the wings and talons of an eagle, Pomola is believed to reside near Mount Katahdin, the highest peak in the state. Tales of encounters with this mythic being have been whispered around campfires, leaving an impression on the collective psyche of the region. Driven by a mix of skepticism and insatiable curiosity, I decided to embark on a journey to investigate this elusive figure. Equipped with a backpack containing essential gear, thermal camera, voice recorder, and basic survival tools, I set forth toward Mount Katahdin a formidable entity rising against the backdrop of Maine's wilderness. As I trekked through the dense forest, my boots sinking slightly into the mossy ground, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the landscape around me. The trees seemed like ancient guardians, and the wind whispered secrets only they were privy to. It was as if the entire forest was holding its breath, anticipating something profound. I finally reached a vantage point near the base of Mount Katahdin as the sun dipped below the horizon. The fading light cast long shadows that danced in the chill of the approaching night. I set up my thermal camera and initiated the voice recorder. If you're out there, Pomola, I mean no harm. I simply wish to understand. I spoke softly into the recorder, the words almost freezing in the icy air. For what felt like an eternity, there was silence, save for the distant rustle of leaves and the occasional howl of a far-off wolf. Then, out of nowhere, a cacophonous roar shattered the tranquility. My thermal camera picked up a rapid fluctuation in temperature, registering a form that was neither wholly animal nor completely human. For a brief second, my eyes met what I can only describe as a visage melding moose and man, framed by expansive feathered wings. Just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure vanished into the looming darkness of the mountain, leaving behind an unnerving silence and a sense of awe that gripped my very core. I collected my equipment and retreated my footsteps quickening with each yard, a newfound respect for the legend filling my thoughts. In the days that followed, I examined the data and recordings which offered no conclusive evidence, no photographs, no ground-breaking EVPs. Yet the experience itself became a different form of evidence, a haunting reminder that legends often contain kernels of truth folded into the fabric of the places they inhabit. I have yet to return to Mount Katahdin, but the legend of Pomola remains etched in my memory, a spectral presence that defies explanation yet demands reverence. Whether it's a guardian spirit of the mountain, a cryptid, or a mere figment of collective folklore, I cannot say. But what is clear is that in the shadowed corners of Maine's wilderness, Mystery and wonder are alive, 
compelling us to question the boundaries of our understanding and to respect the ancient stories that ripple through the land. I decided to go on a solo camping trip in the woods of Eastbrook, Maine. I have been going through some stuff recently and figured that nature would be the perfect escape. I did my research, chose a site, and packed my gear. I was aware of some local legends about the Eastbrook Carpy, but I figured it was all folklore, something to spook the kids. I set up camp in a secluded spot pretty far from the nearest road. The first day was wonderful. I hiked, cooked some food over a fire, and watched the stars come out. As night fell, I crawled into my tent and settled in for a peaceful sleep. Then I heard it. Around midnight, the forest erupted into this blood-curdling scream. It wasn't an animal. I know what bears and coyotes sound like. This was something else. Something human, but twisted. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent a bit to take a look. What I saw next will haunt me forever. About 50 feet away, illuminated by the moonlight, was this figure. It looked like a woman, but her eyes were glowing a faint yellow. Her arms were elongated, with fingers that were way too long. And then she opened her wings. Yes, wings. Feathered, massive, and horrifying. She let out another scream, and then soared upward, disappearing into the tree canopy. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. As soon as the sun came up, I packed my things and hightailed it out of there. The thing is, when I got back to my car, there were scratch marks all over it like something had tried to get in. I've done some digging since I got home, and I found old newspaper articles about sightings of the Eastbrook Carpy. The descriptions match what I saw. This thing has been spotted by locals for decades. I don't know what's out there, and I can't explain what I saw, but I know I won't be going back into those woods alone. I'm even considering selling my camping gear. Be careful out there. You never know what's lurking in the woods. I've been camping my entire life. Deserts, mountains, forests. I thought I'd seen it all. But Maine offered a different kind of solitude, an untouched landscape dotted with old Native American rock paintings that promised more than just a weekend away. It offered an opportunity to truly test myself. The challenge was simple, survive a week in the deep woods with minimal supplies. Day one passed without a hitch. I set up a basic camp, caught some fish and started a fire. As the evening wore on, I admired the rock paintings near my campsite. Figures of men and animals, but also of winged creatures that looked almost divine. That night, something changed. I woke up to find my camp disturbed. My food supply was nearly gone. Had it been an animal? Or perhaps another camper? But no, I was miles away from the nearest trail. A feeling of unease settled over me. On the second night, it happened again, but this time, I heard flapping wings and thunderous cries that shook the ground. Frightened, I clutched my knife and peered into the darkness. Nothing. By the third day, exhaustion was setting in, yet a curious feeling of anticipation overwhelmed me. I found more rock paintings. These depicted what looked like a giant bird locked in combat with human warriors. Thunderbird, the legend said, a powerful spirit creature of Native American folklore. 
On the final night, I heard the flapping wings again. This time, they were louder, closer. Summoning my courage, I stepped out of my tent and looked up. What I saw was magnificent and terrifying. A colossal bird, its feathers shimmering with an ethereal glow, its eyes like burning coals. It circled above me, and then, with a powerful cry that echoed through the woods, disappeared into the night sky. Morning light revealed no evidence of my nocturnal visitor, but the feeling of awe remained. I had completed the challenge, but I realized the true test was not of my survival skills, but of my ability to face the unknown, to coexist with something greater than myself. As I packed up, I felt a newfound sense of respect not just for nature, but for the ancient myths and legends that had lived long before me. I walked away from that week not just as a camper, but as someone who had been touched by something far older and far more mysterious than I had ever imagined. And so I left the forest, a place that had frightened yet enlightened me, knowing that the legend of the Thunderbird was real, at least for those willing to look beyond the veil of the ordinary world. My dog, Max, has always been a good judge of character. He's the kind of dog that would wag his tail at strangers, but growl if he sensed something off. So when he began barking at a specific corner of my room every night, I took notice. It started subtly. Every night around the same time, Max would grow restless. He'd pace around the room, his eyes fixated on the corner. Then he'd bark, loud warning barks that would make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I'd check the corner, but there was never anything there. No bugs, no strange shadows, nothing. This routine continued for weeks. I tried rearranging the furniture, cleaning the corner thoroughly, even placing a small lamp there to dispel any shadows, but nothing worked. Max's nightly barking persisted. One evening, after a particularly long day, I was lying in bed, reading a book with Max by my side. As the clock neared the usual time, Max began to growl, his gaze fixed on the corner. I sighed, preparing myself for the inevitable barking, but this time was different. As I turned my head to look at the corner, my heart skipped a beat. There, standing amidst the dim light, was a shadowy figure. It was tall and slender, its form wavering as if made of smoke. It had no discernible features, just a dark silhouette that seemed to absorb the light around it. Frozen in fear, I could only watch as the figure slowly moved its form shifting and swirling. Max's barks grew louder, more frantic. The figure seemed to acknowledge him, turning its head slightly in his direction. Gathering my courage, I reached for the lamp on my bedside table and switched it on. The room was flooded with light and the shadowy figure vanished instantly. The following day, I contacted a local paranormal investigator, desperate for answers. He arrived with an array of equipment and began his investigation. After several hours, he sat me down and shared his findings. The corner of my room, he explained, had an unusually high electromagnetic reading. Such readings, he said, were often associated with paranormal activity. He believed that the shadowy figure was a residual entity, a remnant of some past event or emotion trapped in a loop. He performed a cleansing ritual using sage and salt and placed protective talismans around my room. As he worked, Max watched intently, occasionally wagging his tail. That night, for the first time in weeks, Max slept peacefully. The corner remained just a corner, devoid of any shadow figures. Days turned into weeks and the incident became a distant memory. Max's nightly barking ceased and the room felt lighter, more welcoming. I often wonder about the shadowy figure. What was its story? Why was it trapped in that corner? 
but some mysteries, I suppose, are best left unsolved, and all I know is that I'm grateful for Max, my loyal protector, always alert to the unseen dangers lurking in the shadows. The radio looked like it belonged in another era. Wooden casing, weathered dials, the sheer heft of it a testament to its age. When I saw it at the yard sale, the nostalgia was too much to resist. Ten bucks and a cloud of dust later, I was back at my apartment, setting it up on my coffee table. I wasn't expecting much, maybe a couple of garbled channels if I was lucky. But when I turned the dial, what I heard sent chills down my spine. It was the unmistakable timber of my grandfather's voice, announcing the date as October 15th, 1965. At first I thought it was some sort of prank or trick. My grandfather had been a radio announcer, yes, but he had passed away years ago. The more I listened, the more I became convinced it was him. His tone, his phrasing, the unique way he pronounced certain words. The broadcast covered mundane topics, some news updates, a baseball game commentary, but interspersed between segments were personal remarks that only he and I would understand. Little sayings, family jokes, names of people we both knew. I sat there, entranced as his voice filled the room. It was as though a portal had been opened linking two moments separated by decades. I wanted to reach through, to talk back, to tell him everything I never got a chance to say. The radio seemed tethered to that specific date, October 15th, 1965. Turning the dial didn't change the channel, only the volume. My phone couldn't pick up any signal when I tried to record the broadcast, and nobody else could hear it when I invited them over. It was as if the radio and I had a private connection, one that defied explanation. I spent nights just sitting there, absorbed in the conversation from the past. My grandfather's voice became a constant presence in my life, a link to a time and a person that were both long gone. The isolation it brought was both comforting and eerie. There was something profoundly unsettling about listening to a voice I knew belonged to someone no longer alive, as though I was eavesdropping on a moment that wasn't meant for me. And then one day, the radio fell silent. I don't know what happened. I tried everything, changed the wiring, replaced the tubes, but it remained mute. My grandfather's voice that had filled my lonely nights was gone. I keep the radio on my bookshelf now, a relic more than anything else. Occasionally, I'll turn the knob, hoping to hear that familiar voice once again. But all I get is static. However, every year on October 15th, I sit down in front of that silent piece of technology. And for a moment, I can almost hear him. My grandfather, speaking to me from another time, another place, another life. Growing up, I had an imaginary friend named Mr. Whispers. He was tall, with elongated limbs and a shadowy face, always obscured by the brim of his old-fashioned hat. As a child, I found comfort in his silent presence. He'd appear in my room, sitting in the corner, watching over me as I played with my toys or read books. Whenever I felt lonely or scared, I would talk to him, and even though he never spoke back, I always felt understood. As I grew older, Mr. Whispers faded away, becoming just a distant memory of my childhood. I went on to college, started a career, and settled into adulthood, leaving behind the whimsical beliefs of my youth. But a few months ago, things changed. I had just moved into a new apartment, and as I was unpacking, I stumbled upon an old drawing I had made as a child. 
It was a crude sketch of Mr. Whispers, his tall figure looming over a smaller depiction of me. Nostalgia washed over me, but it was accompanied by an uneasy feeling, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard it, a soft rustling sound like fabric brushing against the floor. I turned on the bedside lamp and there he was, Mr. Whispers, standing in the corner of my room just as I remembered him. But something was different. His posture was more menacing and the room felt colder. I tried to convince myself it was just a dream, a trick of my tired mind. But night after night he returned and unlike the silent guardian of my childhood, this Mr. Whispers was more aggressive. Objects would move on their own, doors would slam shut, and I'd wake up with unexplained scratches on my arms. One particularly terrifying night, I woke up to find him hovering over my bed, his face inches from mine. For the first time, I heard his voice, a deep, guttural whisper. You left me behind. I decided to seek help. I contacted a local paranormal expert hoping to find answers. As I described my experiences, he listened intently, his expression growing more serious. Imaginary friends, he began, are often manifestations of child's emotions or desires, but sometimes they can be something more sinister, entities from another realm that latch onto the innocence of a child. He believed that Mr. Whispers was one such entity, and now that I had acknowledged him again, he had returned, stronger and more malevolent. The expert performed a cleansing ritual in my apartment using sage and chanting ancient incantations. As he worked, the atmosphere grew tense, and I could feel Mr. Whispers' anger. But as the ritual neared its end, there was a loud, piercing scream, and then silence. The expert left me with a protective talisman and instructions to keep it close. Entities like Mr. Whispers, he warned, are never truly gone. They wait for a moment of weakness to return. It's been weeks since that night, and I've had no further encounters with Mr. Whispers, but I often wonder about the nature of imaginary friends and the thin line between childhood fantasy and paranormal reality. I keep the talisman close, a constant reminder of the unseen world that lurks just beyond our perception. The atmosphere of the office changed at night. What was familiar in the daylight took on a different texture in the solitary glow of my desk lamp. I was working late, again, plowing through spreadsheets and emails in the eerie quiet. I had just clicked over to a new task when it happened. My computer screen blinked for a second, and then words began appearing in a blank Word document. Check the Thompson report. You missed a detail in the second paragraph. My hands hovered over the keyboard fingers suspended in confusion. I was alone in the office, I was certain of that. Even the janitors had already finished their rounds. My mind raced to my old mentor, Karen. She would always catch those little mistakes, the almost invisible details most people would overlook. She had passed away five years ago, a sudden illness that had taken her far too young. People in the office said her work ethic and dedication were unmatched, right up to her last days. Hesitant, I clicked on the Thompson report and skimmed to the second paragraph. Sure enough, I had made an error, a subtle one, a misplaced decimal that could easily have been overlooked, but would have altered the financial summary. A chill crept up my spine. Was this some elaborate prank? Some strange glitch? I looked around my dimly lit office, half expecting to see Karen's stern but encouraging face peering out from behind a bookshelf. But the room was empty. Refocusing on the screen, I corrected the error. As soon as I did, another message appeared on the blank document. Good catch. Don't forget to cross-reference the inventory data. 
It was exactly the kind of tip Karen would give, the kind of meticulous step she insisted could make or break a project. Nervously, I opened the inventory data and began cross-referencing. Within minutes, I found another oversight. Minor to anyone else, but crucial in the grand scheme of things. The night wore on and the tips kept coming. Review the meeting agenda. Double-check the new contract. The formatting on slide 7 is inconsistent. Each tip pointed to a flaw or an oversight that I would have missed, but Karen would have caught. Finally, as the clock neared midnight, a different message appeared on the screen. You're ready for tomorrow. Trust yourself. It was a classic Karen phrase, a seal of approval she'd grant only when she thought you had met her exacting standards. I leaned back in my chair, staring at the words on the screen. The room felt colder, but not in an unwelcoming way. It was as though the air had thickened with purpose, brimming with a silent but palpable intent. I didn't hear from Karen after that night, not in the way I did during those haunting midnight hours. My presentation the next day went smoothly, every detail falling perfectly into place, every tip Karen had provided proving invaluable. Days turned into weeks and the eerie events of that night transformed into a blur, a surreal experience that mingled with the reality of deadlines and meetings. Yet every time I catch a detail I would have otherwise overlooked, or when I take an extra minute to review something most would deem trivial, I can almost sense Karen's approving nod, a silent affirmation from a presence I can neither explain nor forget. A month after Lucy's funeral, the first letter arrived. It was an ordinary Tuesday, filled with drizzling rain and the monotony of my nine-to-five job. The beige envelope stood out in the pile of bills and junk mail, and the handwriting caught my eye immediately. Cursive loops and intricate swirls. It was Lucy's handwriting. I opened it cautiously, my hands trembling a bit. The letter inside unfolded effortlessly, as if it couldn't wait to spill its contents. It detailed a childhood memory, the time we'd built a treehouse in the backwoods behind our old house. The narrative was so precise that it felt like I was reliving the moment. The smell of the fresh cut wood, the feeling of scraped knees, the thrill of secrecy. Only Lucy and I knew about it. A lump formed in my throat. Lucy had died in a car accident. It was sudden and it was brutal, and here was a letter speaking in her voice about events only she would know. Over the next few weeks, more letters arrived. Each envelope was identical, each letter more intimate than the last. They recalled secrets we'd shared, fights we'd had, and the intricate bonds we'd formed as sisters. The letters never explained where they came from, and there was never a return address. It felt both comforting and unsettling to read these letters. Comforting because in those moments I could almost hear Lucy's laughter and feel her presence. Unsettling because with each letter, the walls of reality seemed to thin and I started questioning my own sanity. I decided to confront my family, but when I showed the letters to my mother, her eyes filled with a blend of hope and sorrow as if she wanted to believe but couldn't afford to. My dad just shook his head, muttered about forgeries, and retreated to his home office. The final letter broke the pattern. It described the night Lucy left the house for the last time, how she was running late, how she'd forgotten her lucky charm bracelet. The bracelet had been a gift from me, and it was something she never took off. Yet after the accident, we couldn't find it. In the letter, Lucy wrote that she had wished she'd turned back to get it. Almost did, but decided against it. The last line was, Take care of mom and dad, Soph, and take care of yourself. I miss you. I didn't receive any more letters after that. It was as if Lucy had said her final goodbye, making peace with her untimely departure. 
I found myself torn between relief and an aching emptiness, as if a chapter had closed but left me holding a book with missing pages. Months later, while cleaning the attic, I stumbled upon a small tarnished box. Inside, cushioned on a bed of faded velvet, was Lucy's lucky charm bracelet. I still don't know how it got there, wedged between old yearbooks and dusty Christmas decorations. And maybe I'll never know, but that's okay. Maybe some questions are better left unanswered. The basement had always been a place of mystery in our old family home. Growing up, it was the realm of forgotten relics, dusty boxes, and childhood dares. But as an adult, tasked with clearing out the house after my parents decided to downsize, the basement became a chore. One afternoon, as I sifted through boxes of old photographs and trinkets, I stumbled upon an old tape recorder. It was heavy its plastic casing yellowed with age. Curiosity peaked, I pressed play, expecting to hear a forgotten family memory, or perhaps one of my childhood attempts at recording a radio show. Instead, a chilling voice filled the room. It was a man's voice, shaky and filled with desperation. Please, if anyone finds this, I need help. They're keeping me here. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. The message ended abruptly, replaced by static. My heart raced, a cold sweat forming on my brow. The voice was unfamiliar, and the sheer terror in it was palpable. I immediately contacted the local police. They took the tape recorder and after analyzing the recording they began an investigation. The house had been in our family for generations and no one could recall any incident or person that might be connected to the voice on the tape. Weeks turned into months, and the mystery deepened. The police were unable to identify the man, or determine when the recording was made. The tape itself was old, but without a specific date or more information, leads were scarce. Determined to find answers, I began my own investigation. I scoured local newspapers and archives, looking for any mention of missing persons or mysterious events connected to our home. My search led me to a series of articles from the 1970s about a local man who had vanished without a trace. The man's photo bore a striking resemblance to a young version of a neighbor I remembered from my childhood, Mr. Grayson. I approached Mr. Grayson with my findings, and after some initial hesitation, he revealed a tale. In his youth, he had been involved with a group that dabbled in the dark side of the occult. Drawn in by the allure of forbidden knowledge, he soon found himself in over his head. The group, led by a charismatic but unhinged leader, believed in harnessing the energy of fear. Mr. Grayson had been chosen as their sacrifice, imprisoned and tormented to feed their dark rituals. One fateful night, he managed to escape recording his plea on a tape recorder he found in the basement. He hid the recorder, hoping that somebody would find it and rescue him. But by the time he emerged from his hiding place, the group had disbanded, its members disappearing into the shadows. Traumatized, Mr. Grayson moved away, changed his identity, and tried to forget the past. He returned years later, believing the group was long gone and that he could find some semblance of peace. The revelation sent shockwaves through our community. The police reopened the investigation, and with Mr. Grayson's testimony, they were able to track down and apprehend the remaining members of the group. The tape recorder, once a forgotten relic, had unveiled a dark chapter in our town's history. It served as a haunting reminder of the secrets that can lurk beneath the surface, hidden in the shadows of the past, waiting for the light of truth to reveal them.
The painting caught my eye at a local estate sale. It depicted a figure, a woman dressed in a flowing Victorian era gown, standing at the edge of a dense forest. Her face was obscured by a veil, but there was an undeniable allure to her posture, a sense of mystery that drew me in. Without much thought, I purchased the painting and hung it in my living room. The first few days, it served as a conversation piece. Guests would comment on its haunting beauty, speculating about the identity of the woman and the artist who painted her. But as the days turned into weeks, I began to notice something unsettling. Every morning as I passed by the painting, it seemed as though the figure had moved ever so slightly. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light or my imagination playing games. But day by day, the woman in the painting seemed to be inching closer, moving from the edge of the forest toward the foreground. I tried to rationalize it. Perhaps the paint was reacting to the humidity, or maybe the canvas was warping. But deep down, I knew something supernatural was at play. One evening, as I sat reading in the living room, I glanced up at the painting and froze. The woman was no longer at the edge of the forest. She was now at the very front of the canvas, her veiled face mere inches from breaking free. And as I stared, I could have sworn I saw the fabric of her veil flutter, as if caught in a gentle breeze. Disturbed, I decided to research the painting's origins. A deep dive into local archives led me to a tragic tale from the late 1800s. The woman in the painting was Lady Eleanor, a noblewoman who had vanished without a trace. She was last seen entering the very forest depicted in the painting, and despite extensive searches, no trace of her was ever found. Rumors swirled about her fate. Some believed she had been taken by spirits, while others whispered about a forbidden romance and a heartbroken departure. But one thing was clear. The artist who painted her was deeply in love with Eleanor and devastated by her disappearance. In his grief, he painted the haunting portrait, pouring all his longing and sorrow into the canvas. Realizing the situation, I sought the help of a local medium. She sensed a powerful energy emanating from the painting. The spirits of both Eleanor and the artist intertwined in a dance of love and loss. To free them, we held a seance. As the medium chanted, the room grew cold and the painting seemed to come alive. The forest in the background rustled and Lady Eleanor's veil lifted, revealing a face of ethereal beauty. A soft voice echoed through the room, expressing gratitude for being seen and remembered. With a final heart-rending sigh, the figure in the painting retreated returning to her original position at the edge of the forest. The room warmed and a sense of peace settled over everything. The painting remains in my living room, its beauty undiminished. But now when I look at it, I see not just a portrait of a lost noblewoman, but a testament to the power of love, a reminder that even in death, our stories continue, waiting for someone to bear witness. When I first toured the apartment, I was immediately drawn to its spacious rooms, high ceilings, and large windows that let in an abundance of natural light. However, there was one peculiarity, a locked door in the hallway. The landlord, a middle-aged man with a somewhat nervous demeanor, quickly brushed off my inquiries about it, saying it was just an old storage room, nothing to be concerned about. I moved in, excited to start this new chapter in my life. The first few days were uneventful, filled with unpacking and decorating. But then the noises began. Every night, precisely at midnight, I'd hear it. Soft, persistent scratching coming from behind the locked door. It started as a faint sound, 
almost like the scurrying of a mouse. But as days turned into weeks, it grew louder, more desperate. Curiosity and unease growing, I approached my landlord again, pressing him for more information about the room. He hesitated, then finally relented, sharing a story that had become something of an urban legend in the building. Years ago, the apartment had been occupied by a reclusive artist. He was rarely seen, always engrossed in his work. Rumors swirled about his obsession with a particular piece, a project he kept hidden in that very room. One day, he disappeared without a trace, leaving behind all his belongings. The only sign of his presence was the locked room, from which strange noises could be heard. The landlord admitted that no one had been able to open the door since, and over time it was simply accepted as a quirk of the building. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to take matters into my own hands. With the help of a locksmith, the door was finally opened, revealing a dimly lit room covered in a thick layer of dust. The walls were adorned with various paintings, each more haunting than the last, but the centerpiece was a large canvas in the middle of the room. It depicted a dark, shadowy figure, its form almost human, but with elongated limbs and sharp, claw-like fingers. The background was a chaotic blend of colors, giving the impression of movement and turmoil. As I stared at the painting, a chilling realization washed over me. The scratching noises, the desperate sounds. It was as if the figure was trying to escape the confines of the canvas. Wanting to rid my home of this eerie presence, I contacted an art historian, hoping to gain insight into the painting's origins. She was fascinated by the piece, noting its unique style and the palpable energy it exuded. After extensive research, she discovered that the artist had dabbled in the dark side of the occult, using his work as a medium to channel and trap restless spirits. The shadowy figure in the painting was believed to be one such entity, bound to the canvas by the artist's dark rituals. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I sought the help of a spiritual expert. He performed a cleansing ritual, releasing the trapped spirit from the painting and ensuring it could no longer harm anyone. The painting was safely stored away, and the room was sealed once more. The nightly scratching ceased, and a sense of peace returned to the apartment. The experience served as a reminder of the power of art and the thin line that separates our world from the unknown. It taught me that some doors, both literal and metaphorical, are best left unopened, and that behind every locked door lies a story waiting to be told. was an unexpected discovery, hidden beneath the floorboards of my newly purchased Victorian home. It was a delicate piece with a deep blue gemstone set in ornate silver. The moment I clasped it in my hand, a rush of emotions flooded over me, fear, sorrow, and a deep sense of longing. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, the dreams began. I found myself in a bustling town square, the surroundings unfamiliar yet oddly comforting. The attire, the architecture, everything hinted at a time long past. In this dream world, I was a young woman named Ilara, living a life of privilege but bound by societal expectations. Night after night, the dreams delved deeper into Ilara's life. I felt her joys her heartbreaks, and her secret love affair with a man named Samuel, a talented blacksmith. Their love was passionate but forbidden, as Ilara was promised to another, a wealthy merchant named Lord Blackthorn. The dreams grew more intense, culminating in a fateful evening. Samuel had crafted a pendant for Ilara, the same one I had found as a symbol of their undying love. 
but their secret rendezvous was discovered by Lord Blackthorn. In a fit of rage and jealousy, he confronted Alara, and the confrontation turned deadly. The last thing I felt in the dream was a sharp pain, the world fading to black, the pendant slipping from Ilara's grasp. I awoke with a start, the weight of Ilara's memories pressing down on me. The pendant wasn't just a piece of jewelry. It was a link to a past life, a life cut tragically short. Determined to find closure, I began researching the history of my home and the town. The local archives revealed a tale that mirrored my dreams. Ilara and Samuel were real, their love story a tragic chapter in the town's history. Lord Blackthorn, consumed by guilt, had become a recluse and the pendant was lost to time. With the truth revealed, I felt a duty to honor Ilara's memory. I sought out Samuel's descendants, discovering that his great-great-grandson was a historian living in the same town. Together, we erected a memorial in the town square, commemorating the love story of Alara and Samuel, ensuring their tale would never be forgotten. The dreams ceased, but the pendant remained with me, a tangible connection to a past life. It served as a reminder of the cyclical nature of existence, the idea that love transcends time, and that sometimes the universe grants us a chance to right the wrongs of the past. The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area. A notorious 10-mile stretch, it had more legends associated with it than any other road in the U.S. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road, a decrepit looking truck from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances, and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life. Its engine roared and it started moving, backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. 
Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. The highway stretched out in front of me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the Arizona desert. It was past midnight, and I was the only car in sight. The sky was so clear that the stars looked like pinpricks on a dark curtain, and I felt as though I was driving through space, alone in the universe. It was a peaceful sort of isolation. But then my car started to sputter, Glancing down at the dashboard, I saw the needle on the fuel gauge sink dangerously close to E. I cursed myself for not checking earlier. Just as I began to pull over, my headlights flickered and died. In an instant, I was plunged into darkness, save for the dim illumination provided by the moon and stars. Nervous but determined, I managed to pull my car off to the side of the road. I took out my phone to call for help, but no bars. I was in a dead zone. Great, I muttered, contemplating limited options. That's when I noticed it. A soft, bluish glow in the distance, beyond the road, somewhere amidst the cacti and brush. My first thought was that it was another vehicle, but the light didn't resemble headlights. It was more ethereal pulsating softly, like the light of a firefly, but much brighter. Curiosity overcoming caution, I grabbed a flashlight and stepped out of the car, locking the doors behind me. I began walking toward the light. As I got closer, I realized the glow was emanating from a cluster of rocks arranged in a circle. The rocks themselves seemed to be the source of the light, I reached out to touch one, half expecting to feel heat, but they were cool to the touch. As my fingers made contact, the rocks glowed brighter, and for a moment I felt a strange sensation, like an electric charge running through me. Images flashed in my mind, strange symbols, a night sky different from our own, and faces I couldn't recognize. Just as quickly, the visions were gone. Stunned, I stepped back. The rocks dimmed, returning to their original glow. Shaken, I returned to my car, my mind buzzing with questions. When I got back in, I turned the key in the ignition, half expecting it not to work. To my surprise, the car roared back to life, headlights and all. Confused but grateful, I drove away constantly glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see the glowing rocks follow me. They didn't, but as I looked back one final time, I swear I saw them flash brightly, as if saying goodbye, or perhaps until next time. I don't know what I stumbled upon that night. Some local legends speak of spirit stones, rocks imbued with mystical energies, but what I experienced seemed beyond the realm of any folklore. Those glowing rocks and the visions they triggered have left me both intrigued and humbled, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the boundaries of human understanding, even in the empty stretches of an Arizona highway. My work as a geologist often took me to remote corners of Arizona, places where the roads stretch out into the horizon and the desert stretches out even further. A landscape that could be hypnotic in its repetitive beauty. But that day in September, the land felt different somehow, its eerie emptiness weighing heavily on me. I was returning from a soil testing job 
driving my well-worn pickup down a highway I'd traversed at least a dozen times before. Dusk was falling, casting long shadows on the ground and turning the sky into a canvas of reds and purples. I was listening to a podcast about ancient civilizations, their folklore and myths, which usually fascinated me. But on that drive, the words became a monotonous drone, blending into the background as I struggled to keep my focus. Just when my eyes were becoming a little too heavy for comfort, I saw it, a solitary tree standing near the highway. This wouldn't be remarkable in any other circumstance, but this tree was ablaze. Flames leapt from its branches, yet it didn't seem to be burning down. It stood there, a spectacle of fire against the backdrop of the setting sun. I pulled over, grabbed my fire extinguisher, and ran toward it. But as I got closer, I realized something astonishing. There was no heat emanating from the flames. Cautiously, I extended a hand toward the fire and felt nothing but the cool desert air. The flames were cold, or at least not hot. My rational mind grappled with this impossibility. It was then that I heard the whisper, a hushed voice so soft it was almost drowned out by the crackling flames. Help me, it said. I looked around, thinking someone must be playing a trick on me, but there was no one. I was alone with this inexplicable burning tree. Who are you? I stammered, feeling ridiculous for talking to a tree, but unable to help myself. I am bound, the voice whispered, more audibly this time. Release me. Without thinking, I pulled out the small hatchet I kept in my toolkit for sample collection. As the blade cut through the bark, the flames flickered, as if reacting to my touch. Finally, with one last swing, I severed a branch. The moment it fell, the flames vanished, leaving the tree as it was, just a tree. I felt a sudden rush of wind and a feeling of liberation washed over me. The tree looked normal, mundane even, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something extraordinary had just occurred. I took the severed branch with me, storing it carefully in the back of my pickup. That night, I did some research and found local Native American legends about spirits being trapped in trees, waiting for someone to release them. Could it be that I had encountered one such spirit? Rational explanations eluded me, but the branch, still untouched by burn marks, was a tangible, physical proof that I clung to. Since then, my views on the paranormal have shifted. I don't know what I released that day or what it meant, but I do know that the desert is a place of mysteries, some better left unsolved, others begging to be explored. Whatever it was, that fiery visage is etched in my memory, a constant reminder that reality is far more complex and wondrous than we can ever fully comprehend. My eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon, flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. 
In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early 20s, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment. But what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off, yet I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then, from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, she let out a wail, a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say, but I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. It had been an exhausting day of meetings in Phoenix, and I was more than eager to make the drive back to my home in Flagstaff. The thought of my own bed was the only thing keeping me going as I sped down the empty highway. Arizona's night sky was something to marvel at, endless and filled with stars, a stark contrast to the city lights I'd left behind. I was about halfway through the journey when it happened. A flicker of light in the sky caught my attention. Not unusual, of course. Shooting stars are a common sight in these parts. But then another flicker followed, this time a bit longer, accompanied by two more bursts of light. My curiosity peaked, I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look. I stepped out of the car, the cool desert air filling my lungs as I looked up. At first, there was nothing but the usual celestial panorama, but then I saw them. A series of lights, glowing orbs really, moving in a formation unlike any aircraft I had ever seen. They were perfectly synchronized, darting around in complex patterns that made my head spin. It lasted for maybe a minute, but it felt like an eternity. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, the lights shot upward and vanished, leaving me staring at an empty sky. I stood there, dumbfounded. 
I'm a rational person, or at least I'd like to think I am. But what I had just witnessed defied any rational explanation. I considered taking out my phone to record the phenomenon, but realized I'd been so awestruck that the thought hadn't even crossed my mind until it was too late. Climbing back into the car, I continued my drive home, my mind racing with questions. Had I just seen UFOs? A secret military operation? Or something else entirely? And why me? Why there, on that empty stretch of Arizona highway? The questions persisted long after I got home and crawled into bed. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with dreams of lights in the sky, darting around in formations that seemed to spell out messages I couldn't quite decipher. In the days that followed, I scoured news reports and social media, looking for any mention of the mysterious lights, but found nothing. It was as if I had been the sole witness to this celestial ballet. That experience changed something in me. Whenever I look up at the night sky now, it's not just stars I see, but possibilities. Countless, endless possibilities that stretch as far as the universe itself. Whether those lights were extraterrestrial in nature or something else entirely, I may never know. But they serve as a constant reminder that the world is filled with mysteries. And sometimes, those mysteries choose to reveal themselves when you least expect it, under a sprawling canopy of an Arizona sky. I never really gave much credence to stories about the unexplained or the supernatural. Ghosts, UFOs, cryptids. I lumped them all into the category of campfire tales and tabloid fodder. But one late night drive through the desolate stretches of Arizona's highways changed all that. I was traveling from Flagstaff, a drive I'd made countless times before. It was around 1 AM, and the night was as clear as it gets the sky peppered with stars. The highway was empty, save for the occasional truck or car that would soon pass, a fleeting encounter with another soul in this vast, dark expanse. My playlist was running low on songs and my caffeine high was starting to wear off. I told myself another hour and I'd be in Flagstaff, out of this car, in bed. That's when I saw it. The shape or rather shapes, far ahead on the road. As I got closer, the shapes started to take form. They looked like animals, but not any animals I'd seen before. They were large, too large to be coyotes, and their gait was awkward, kind of hunched and erratic. I slowed down as I approached them. They seemed to be crossing the highway, completely unbothered by my car. The first instinct was to grab my phone and snap a picture, but as I reached for it, one of the creatures turned its head to look at me. Its eyes glowed an eerie, unnatural shade of yellow. I froze, my hand hovering over the phone. The look in those eyes was unsettling, inexplicably so. It wasn't just animal curiosity. It was almost as if it recognized me, or recognized that I recognized it. And then, as swiftly as they had appeared, they were gone, disappearing into the scrub and cacti on the side of the road. I sat there, still slowed to a near halt, my hands trembling on the wheel. I drove off, my heart pounding and my mind racing. Rational explanations came and went. Desert barrages, maybe? Or perhaps they were just animals, distorted by the dark and my own sleepy imagination. Yet that look, that haunting, penetrating gaze stayed with me. When I finally got to Flagstaff, I couldn't shake off the unease. I looked up local legends and folklore about Arizona's highways and found tales of skinwalkers, shape-shifting creatures from Native American folklore. 
could that be what I encountered? I didn't know, and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. Since that night, I have avoided driving that stretch of highway, always opting for alternative routes even if they add time to my journey. I've also stopped scoffing at tales of the unexplained. After all, there are things out there in the dark, lonely roads of Arizona that defy understanding, and I've seen them with my own eyes. The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart, ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Pokemoonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off, attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents, and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise, a low rumble like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could. 
a shared encounter with the unexplained, forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore. Because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation, something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. I don't know her name, nor do I wish to. I'm not even sure if she's female. All I'm certain of is that around 2.30 in the morning, sometimes I awake to find her standing in front of my window. But let's start from the beginning. When I was two, my uncle tragically passed away due to an accident involving a patch of ice at the bottom of a hill. I don't remember much from then, but I distinctly recalled dancing at the cemetery during his funeral. Clad in an outfit I was cautioned not to dirty, I noticed everyone's somber expressions. There was a sea of mourners, including children who appeared a bit unusual. Ignoring their oddity, I danced with them, executing the innocent clumsy steps of a child. My aunt, upon noticing, admonished me Stop dancing with the dead. It's inappropriate. The rest, up until I was eight, is based on my mother's account. After the funeral, I would often point out peculiar individuals among us, describing them as old, sometimes hurt-looking people. Given her belief in the supernatural, my mother deduced that I was seeing spirits and advised me to disregard them. I heeded her words until one night when I was eight. I can vividly recall that night. As I lay in bed, I awoke abruptly to a street light illuminating my room through the curtains. Before me stood a woman in an old-fashioned dress, reminiscent of Victorian times, positioned inexplicably in front of my window, even though my dresser blocked its access. From the back, she appeared ordinary, perhaps a spirit from a bygone era, but when she turned, I was met with a haunting sight. Where her eyes should have been, there were black voids, and her chest bore a similar darkness where her heart should be. While she emanated no threat, I instinctively sensed her abnormality and ran to my mother in terror. Thereafter, I started experiencing nightmares related to my surroundings. Whether it's an animal or human suffering, these dreams always tie back to the land I reside on, leaving me emotionally drained. Once, I sought counsel from a priest who suggested she might be a demonic entity blocking my spiritual sight. His advice was to seek spiritual guidance from a variety of sources, including shamans and white covens, given my lack of strict religious affiliation. The uncanny aspect is that when I've researched the histories of places related to my nightmares, they often mirror the horrors I've witnessed in my dreams. Though I discuss my ability to see ghosts openly, I mostly ignore them now, just as my mother advised. It's bizarre yet fascinating to witness figures from the 1800s amidst the hustle and bustle of modern-day Vancouver. Tangible, yet not. Out of an abundance of caution, I've undergone several medical examinations to rule out any neurological or psychological disorders. The results revealed high-functioning autism, but no conditions that could induce hallucinations. I maintain a clean lifestyle, abstaining from drugs, alcohol, and smoking. This leaves me puzzled. Why do I see these apparitions? Is this woman truly demonic? And if she shields me from painful memories, do I want her to depart? Unfortunately, I am left with more questions than answers.
In 2007, I frequently traveled between Alberta and British Columbia with my then boyfriend, whom I'll refer to as John. The journey was breathtaking, meandering through mountains, glacial lakes, and impressive rock formations. I mention these details because I have a hunch they're relevant, though it's just a gut feeling. One particular morning before a trip, something shifted in my mind. I can't determine if something external caused this or if I was the catalyst. Although it might sound like I'm describing a schizophrenic episode, I want to clarify that I have PTSD and bipolar too, but not schizophrenia. If this doesn't fit the narrative, it's okay. The day started as any other, but a bizarre conviction overtook me. I felt certain that John was planning to kill me in the mountains on behalf of my father. This idea was preposterous. Neither my father nor John had any reason or inclination to harm me. Convinced of this alternate reality, though, I confronted John. It seemed he shared this disturbing belief. He evaded my questions. And as my distress grew, his demeanor changed. His voice altered, and subtle changes appeared on his face. He seemed to morph into someone else, a transformation I can't quite explain. Everything became surreal, like a lucid dream. The depth and complexity of the conversations and situations we found ourselves in were overwhelming. We discussed topics that I can't recall. At times, John seemed to alternate between himself and this other entity, who I whimsically identified as Satan or a manifestation of pure evil. Sounds crazy, right? By this time, I had worked as an escort in the city for about three years. This trip marked a turning point, and I left that life behind. Fast forward a bit and things became even stranger. We had taken a different route, one that John was familiar with from his work travels. However, our journey between places seemed unnaturally fast, and the towns en route seemed incomplete or transitional. Time felt distorted. Though in real time, our trip took three days, it felt like a week had elapsed. When we finally reached the city, reality seemed to reassert itself, though not entirely. We intended to pick up furniture, but although I remember having the furniture later on, the act of acquiring it remains hazy. After leaving the city, the night seemed to fall suddenly, and we were back on that eerie road. Our reality became fragmented, shifting between different states of awareness. At times, John transformed into that malevolent being, while at other moments, he was just John. We found ourselves trapped in a looping timeline, one that only progressed when we made the right change. As things escalated, John's intent seemed murderous. I felt trapped in this cycle of dark and light. In my desperation, I prayed fervently, seeking help. Suddenly, I was outside the truck, running along the road, with John, or that other thing, chasing me in the vehicle. Despite the terror, I resolved to keep running, driven by sheer will. Then, abruptly, I was back in the truck with John. The terrifying alternate reality still lingered, but it slowly began to fade as daylight approached and we neared familiar places. There were a few lingering time loops, but we eventually returned home, where time flowed normally once again. John and I tried to process what happened. Initially, we discussed it in depth, but over time, John avoided the topic. The initial belief that he intended to kill me remained unexplained and unfounded. When I recounted the story to my father, he was upset, suspecting that I was using drugs or losing my sanity, but neither was true. For years, I have tried to locate that mysterious high road, but I've never succeeded. On two occasions, I felt I saw others using this road, once with a former boss after a traumatic work incident, and once with someone linked to my past in escorting. Both experiences predated that bewildering trip with John, 
and I can find absolutely no evidence that that road exists. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I can't explain any of these experiences. I'm from Northern British Columbia, Canada. A few years ago, my friend invited me to join him, his mother, and sister at a resort beside a lake roughly 90 minutes from our town. This trip occurred at the cusp of June and July. Now, I term it a resort because while it has a primary log building, which functions as both a check-in spot and a restaurant, it's mostly just a collection of log cabins with spaces near the lake for RVs. So, resort is in very heavy air quotes. The location is predominantly surrounded by expansive forests, with the only real disruption being the highway that slices through the woods. Despite a few scattered houses around the lake, it's generally a quiet area, unless it's a holiday weekend. A winding road connects the cabins to the main building, which is a brief five to eight minute walk. Beyond the main structure, there is a clearing with tables, seemingly untouched for a decade, given the overgrown vegetation around them. A short distance from these tables, within the woods, lie two lagoons encircled by an old wire fence. We arrived in the evening, familiarized ourselves with our cozy log cabin, and began exploring. The first day was fairly uneventful, but the next day's overcast and rainy weather was surprisingly welcome. It ensured fewer visitors, granting us more freedom. Our explorations led us to the clearing with the old tables, which clearly hadn't been used in ages given the encroaching nature. Delving further, about 50 feet into the woods, we discovered the lagoons. An intriguing detail was a section of the wire fence, flattened as if a large animal had passed over it. We nonchalantly dismissed it and continued our exploration, intending to return later. However, our next visit was cut short by strange noises, reminiscent of footsteps from the previous day's path. This experience kept us on edge, but we rationalized that it might just be the local wildlife. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, we even ventured to another forested spot near the cabins, where, oddly enough, we heard echoes of our own actions. It was like somebody mimicking our branch-breaking sounds. This was even more unsettling when we realized the unlikelihood of another person being in that same remote spot. Later that evening, our attempts to recreate the sounds were interrupted by a strange and frightening sight, a shadowy figure hiding behind a tree. Panic took over and we fled back to our cabin. That night's discussion was more sober as we tried to make sense of the figure and the sounds. Fast forward a year and we were back, this time with an additional friend. We briefed him about our prior adventures, which he met with skepticism. Yet the ensuing days made a believer out of him. Our encounters this time were mostly around the lagoon area. We again heard the footsteps, and on our last day, a terrifying, indescribable screech. Investigating, we were met with a sudden, massive sound of something heavy hitting the ground. We fled in terror only to later encounter a black bear, which, to our astonishment, seemed just as afraid and bolted away. It wasn't afraid of us, either. It was running from the direction where we had just had our encounter. It barely even looked at us. As I contemplate revisiting this year, I recount this story to seek insights. Two distinct entities seem to reside there the elusive woodsman or tree knocker, and the aggressive entity that we have dubbed the Screecher. Despite scouring the internet, I have found no similar experiences. 
Does anybody have insights or theories about these mysterious presences? The location, despite its oddities, is genuinely picturesque and offers great amenities. It's known as a Purden Lake Resort, with a notable green roof. Anyway, I welcome any theories about what might be lurking here. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, and a friend who awaited my shift's end. Given the peacefulness of the evening, I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street, and to the right there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant. Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. In 2003, fresh out of high school, I was living in a quaint town in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia. Despite its breathtaking altitude and scenic views, it was a place with a small populace, exuding a distinctly rural vibe. One night, my best friend and I found ourselves lounging in her Honda Civic. We had parked on a secluded dirt road, deep within the woods, ensconced by trees with a clearing overhead. As we chatted away, reveling in the melodies of our favorite tracks and enjoying some devil's lettuce, the clock neared one o'clock in the morning. Out of the blue, a strange phenomenon occurred. Every inch of our surroundings, the sky above and even the interior of our car, were illuminated by an intense neon blue light. This glow, which lasted for about two to three seconds, was unique because it was completely omnipresent. 
It didn't cast a shadow. It didn't really have a source. It wasn't like a spotlight. It felt as if the light permeated everything and vanished as quickly as it appeared. Our initial reaction was shock. We first thought maybe it was the police, but a quick scan of our environment confirmed our isolation. No soul in sight. And the town was enveloped in its usual nocturnal stillness. Without exchanging many words, driven by a sense of unease, we started the car and made our way home. To this day, we have no idea what that light could have been. Boston's Freedom Trail is a path steeped in history, a two and a half mile long route that takes you past 16 historically significant sites. It's a well-trodden path for tourists, but for locals like me, it's also a popular running route. On cool mornings, the trail offers a chance to immerse oneself not just in exercise, but also in the echoes of revolutions past. It was one such morning, the city still shrouded in mist, that I encountered something profoundly inexplicable. I was nearing the Paul Revere house, lost in thought, when the distant sound of footsteps caught my attention. They were rhythmic, unmistakably those of another runner. However, the steps sounded older, more like the clatter of dress shoes than modern sneakers. Curious, I increased my pace, attempting to catch a glimpse of the fellow early bird. Rounding a corner, I saw him, a man dressed entirely out of time. His attire resembled the colonial era, breeches, a waistcoat, and even a tricorn hat. Oddly, he seemed to shimmer, his form not entirely solid, more like a figure rendered in watercolors. He was not one of the reenactors of the area. Of that, I was sure. The man ran with a purpose, occasionally glancing over his shoulder with an expression of deep concern, as if being chased. He didn't seem to see me, though. Deciding to follow, I kept a respectful distance. The journey felt timeless, every footfall resonating with whispers of yesteryears. As we neared the old state house, the man's pace became frantic. It was then that I recalled a tale I'd once heard, a patriot during the American Revolution who had been entrusted with a message vital for the colonial leaders. He was pursued relentlessly, but was said to have mysteriously vanished without delivering his message, changing the course of a pivotal battle. Reaching the old state house's steps, the phantom runner suddenly stopped, his form dissipating into the morning fog, leaving behind only silence. I stood there, heart pounding, trying to process what I'd witnessed. My city, Boston, was not just a guardian of the past. It was an active participant in its retelling. Now, whenever I lace up my running shoes and hit the Freedom Trail, I do so with reverence, understanding that every step taken is not just a stride forward, but also a journey back into the embrace of Boston's history. Symphony Hall, home to the Boston Symphony Orchestra, is renowned for its flawless acoustics and architectural splendor. Little did I know, however, that the hallowed hall is also played host to sounds from beyond our realm. I had recently joined the team as an audio technician, a job that often required me to be in the hall during odd hours, testing equipment and ensuring everything was set for performances. One evening, after the last musician had left, I stayed behind to calibrate a new sound system. With the vast hall empty and silent, I set to work. Suddenly, the unmistakable sound of a violin filled the room. The melody was mournful, yet beautiful, echoing through the hall with perfect clarity. 
Initially assuming that a musician had stayed behind to practice, I followed the sound to its source. However, when I reached the main stage, it was completely empty. The music, meanwhile, seemed to be emanating from a specific seat in the audience. Approaching cautiously, I found an old photograph on the seat. It was of a young woman, violin in hand, her eyes reflecting a deep passion for music. Puzzled, I showed the photograph to an elderly janitor who had worked at Symphony Hall for decades. His face turned pale as he shared the tale of Eleanor, a prodigious violinist from the 1920s, touted to be the next big sensation in classical music. On the eve of her debut performance at Symphony Hall, she tragically passed away, her dream of playing on the grand stage left unfulfilled. Legend had it that her spirit still visited the hall, playing her violin, pouring her soul into every note, ensuring her music resonated in a place she held so dear. Skeptical, yet intrigued, I placed a recorder in the hall every night. Each morning, I would find a new recording of a mysterious violin solo, each more poignant than the last. Though I never saw Eleanor's spirit, I felt her presence every time I stepped into Symphony Hall. Her haunting melodies became a testament to the undying passion artists hold for their craft, transcending even the barriers of life and death. Now, when the lights dim and the audience settles, I often close my eyes, listening intently, hoping to catch a note or two from Eleanor's violin. A spectral serenade forever echoing within the walls of Symphony Hall. Boston Opera House, a place of magnificence, where art and history meld into one. Its ornate architecture is a testament to bygone eras, and its walls have witnessed countless tales of passion, tragedy, and triumph. But there's one story that remains largely untold, hidden amidst the applause and standing ovations. It began on a night like any other. I was attending a performance of Swan Lake, a favorite of mine. As the ballet progressed, I became entranced by a dancer who wasn't listed in the program. Her movements were graceful, transcending the bounds of the stage, almost ethereal. Every pirouette and leap seemed to defy gravity. During the intermission, I inquired about her, but to my surprise, no one else seemed to have noticed her. They attributed my query to being captivated by the main performers, but I was certain of what I had seen. The ballet resumed, but she was nowhere in sight. That was until the final act. As the curtain slowly descended, she appeared at the edge of the stage, bathed in a single spotlight, dancing a melancholic solo. As her dance reached its climax, she vanished, leaving only echoing silence behind. Intrigued, I decided to delve into the history of the opera house. Buried in the archives, I found a tragic story from the 1920s. Lillian, a prodigious ballerina, was set to debut her solo performance. But on the eve of her premiere, she mysteriously vanished, never to be seen again. The lore goes that on some nights, when the moon is just right and the stars align, Lillian returns to the stage she never got to grace, dancing her heart out for an audience she never had. Returning to the opera house weeks later, I managed to find an elderly usher who had been working there for decades. When I mentioned Lillian, his eyes clouded with a mix of fear and sadness. He whispered to me that over the years, select attendees, especially those deeply passionate about ballet, have reported seeing a mysterious dancer, always during Swan Lake, always dancing a solo during the curtain call. Lillian's spirit, it seems, is forever intertwined with the opera house, her passion and dedication transcending time. She remains a silent testament to the artists of yesteryear, 
a reminder that art, in its purest form, is eternal. Now, every time I visit the Boston Opera House, I find a seat in the balcony, gazing at the stage, hoping to catch a glimpse of the timeless dancer, forever trapped between the world of the living and the embrace of the arts. Nestled within the heart of Boston, Beacon Hill is renowned for its cobblestone streets, federal-style row houses, and gaslit lamps. I had recently moved into a quaint brownstone there, relishing the historical ambiance the neighborhood offered. The apartment was cozy, its walls echoing stories from the past. The previous owner had left behind an antique gramophone, a relic from a bygone era. I found it charming, and it quickly became the centerpiece of my living room. One evening, after a particularly tiring day, I was jolted awake by a soft melody playing from the gramophone. Confused, since I hadn't acquired any records for it yet, I approached the device. The turntable spun, but there was no record. The music was hauntingly beautiful, an old ballad of love and loss. As the tune played, a sudden drop in temperature enveloped the room. My breath became visible, forming small puffs of mist. And then, in the dim light of the gas lamp, I saw her. A translucent figure, dressed in a flowing gown from the 1800s, waltzing alone, her movements graceful and full of longing. Her eyes, deep pools of sadness, seemed to be searching for someone. Not wanting to disturb her, I watched in silent awe. As the final notes of the melody faded, she extended her hand as if beckoning a partner to join her. But alas, no one came. With a forlorn sigh, she vanished, leaving the room in silence. The following day, eager to understand what I had just witnessed, I visited the local library. Delving into the history of my residence, I uncovered a tragic love story from the 19th century. Eleanor, a talented violinist, lived in my very apartment. She was betrothed to a sailor, Thomas, who had promised to return to her after his final voyage. To celebrate their upcoming nuptials, Eleanor had composed a ballad, which she played on her gramophone each night, awaiting Thomas's return. However, he never did. Heartbroken, Eleanor passed away from what folks termed a broken heart. Now it seems her spirit remains tethered to the brownstone of Beacon Hill, forever waiting for her lover's return, seeking solace in the melody of their unfinished love story. Some nights, when the wind howls and the gas lamps flicker, I play the gramophone, filling the room with music, hoping to give Eleanor a few moments of peace and a dance with the memories of her lost love. Beacon Hill, with its gaslit streets and federal-style row houses, always felt to me like a step back in time. The quaint neighborhood, rich in history and allure, was a daily reminder of Boston's storied past. My family's home, passed down through generations, sat nestled in its heart. One summer, while renovating the basement, we unearthed a hidden passage leading to a small, sealed chamber. Inside, we found remnants of what seemed like an old tavern, wooden stools, dusty bottles, and an old ledger filled with names, many dating back to the revolutionary era. Soon after the discovery, strange occurrences began. Every night, muffled voices echoed from the basement, the clinking of glasses, laughter, and debates, all culminating into the tune of a fiddle. It was as though the tavern had sprung back to life, playing host to its long-departed patrons. 
curiosity overcoming fear, I decided to spend a night in the chamber. As midnight approached, the atmosphere shifted. The room, though void of any living soul but myself, felt crowded. Shadows flitted across the walls, and soon, the murmurs began. I could discern snippets of conversations, tales of battle, secret meetings, revolutionary plans, and stories of love and loss. Among these voices, one stood out, a young woman's voice singing a mournful ballad of a lover lost at sea. As dawn neared, the spectral gathering waned, and the chamber plunged back into silence. I emerged from the basement, feeling a deep connection with the spirits that once called Boston their home. Digging deeper into the house's history, I learned that it stood atop an old tavern, a hot spot for revolutionaries, thinkers, and sailors in the 18th century. The singer, as per local legends, was Lillian, the tavern owner's daughter, who often sang for patrons and tragically lost her fiancé to the tempestuous Atlantic. Today, our basement remains a testament to Beacon Hill's vibrant past. While we've modernized it, the old chamber is preserved, and on some nights, when the winds howl and the city sleeps, you can still hear the echoes of a time gone by, the whispers beneath the cobblestones, reminding us of the souls that once walked these streets and the stories they left behind. I'll never forget the summer night my friends and I decided to explore the waterfall and creek on my family's rural property. We were bored teens looking for adventure. Little did we know what we would awaken. As dusk faded to darkness, we hiked along the creek, conjuring imaginary monsters in the shadows. Reaching the waterfall, we scrambled up the slippery rocks, laughter echoing. Behind the cascading water, a recess opened in the cliffside. Flashlight beams revealed a tunnel leading back into darkness. Grinning, we ducked inside, the roar of the falls fading behind us. The narrow cave passage spiraled deep into the earth, dripping water eroding strange patterns on the walls. It felt primal, pristine. Our voices bounced eerily down the unknown corridor. Finally, the tunnel opened into a high-ceilinged cavern with gigantic stalactites hanging like stone daggers. We craned our necks, awestruck. It was like entering a natural cathedral. Venturing farther, we stumbled upon something incredible, an underground lake, ink black and still as glass. Stalagmites ringed the shore like stone sentries. The place seemed off somehow, heavy with secrets best left undisturbed. Shivering despite the cavern's warmth, I turned to leave. The others begged to stay and explore, their voices too loud in the oppressive silence. Then the still black lake began to ripple, at first just faintly, then increasing until the entire surface roiled and churned violently, frothing white. My friend's laughter turned to screams. I shouted for everyone to run. We tore back through the twisting passageway as roaring filled the cavern, terrible and deafening. I chanced a backward glance and saw a pale, sinuous shape rising from the frothing water, malformed and gargantuan. We scrambled desperately up the slick tunnel, lungs burning, that monstrous roar pursuing us. Finally, we tumbled out behind the waterfall and sprinted down the wooded trail. At the farmhouse, we collapsed, gasping but too terrified to speak of what had awakened in that buried abyss. I only know we unleashed something primeval, lurking in those sunless depths since the dawn of time, something that knows the surface world still waits above, full of light and life 
not yet corrupted. The cave entrance now lies collapsed, sealed shut by a recent quake according to geologists, but deep in my bones I know the truth, that the tunnel collapse was no quake. It was the only way to re-entomb that which we should never have freed. I still have nightmares of the warped white form erupting from the subterranean lake, slamming into the cave walls in chaotic rage as it surged toward the surface, toward freedom. Whatever that ancient thing was, it thirsts to be unleashed, and I fear one day it may finish crawling out of the depths we disturbed its patience eternal. I've always been fascinated by abandoned places. There's something haunting about remnants of lives once lived, crumbling back into nature. Last summer, while scouring satellite maps online, I discovered what looked like an overgrown plantation estate, deep in the rural county where I live. The curiosity was too much. I had to explore it. On a humid June day, I drove out following the GPS coordinates until I reached a seldom used dirt road snaking back into the dense forest. After a bumpy mile, I caught sight of a stone pillar framed by oak trees at the end of an overgrown driveway. This had to be the place. I parked and walked up the crumbling drive to find myself before the decaying facade of a once stately plantation home, two stories tall with white columns out front. The windows stared back like gaping eye sockets, frames drooping with rot. I strolled around to the side porch its roof sagging under the weight of vines and kutsu. The back gardens were an impenetrable sea of weeds and brambles. Clearly, no one had lived here in decades. What stories lingered within these dead walls? I was itching to get inside and find out. Testing the front door, I found it unlocked. Hinges screeched as I eased it open just enough to slip through into the dusty foyer. Flecks of peeling wallpaper and plaster crunched under my footsteps. A musty odor hung in the air. I wandered slowly through the vacant rooms. Peeling floral wallpaper revealed the lathe beneath in places. Old furniture lay strewn about, drawers hanging open, dollies and books scattered across the floor. In what was once a grand parlor, the marble fireplace had collapsed its elaborate mantle cracked completely in two. Moving upstairs, I paused in a child's room. Shelves still held scattered wooden toys, headless dolls, a faded pink blanket spilling from an iron bed frame. What long ago little girl had once played here, I wondered. What tragedy befell this family, leaving their home stranded in time? A sudden loud thump from below made me jump just the old house settling, I told myself. Yet somehow it sounded almost purposeful. A minute later, another heavy thud seemed to come from the walls. Unease trickled down my spine. Maybe I should leave. Heading downstairs, I felt watched from every crevice and dark corner. I quickened my pace through the musty rooms. Turning a corner, I halted in shock. A tall, thin figure stood silhouetted in a doorway up ahead, dusty sunlight streaming behind. Heart racing, I stumbled back around the corner and pressed myself against the wall, willing my panicked breaths to quiet. When I dared to peer around again seconds later, the hallway stood empty. The back of my neck prickled as I looked around wildly. Where could someone have possibly gone so quickly? and without a sound. A loud crash came from upstairs, as if a door had been flung violently open. That was enough for me. I bolted outside, not stopping even after I reached my car. Tires spit gravel as I tore down the winding dirt driveway, every glance in the rearview mirror half expecting to see a pallid face 
watching from the gloom within those dead halls. But as time passed, my unease faded. I told myself it was all in my head, a trick of the light and shadows, but I don't think I believe that. I'll never return to explore the rest of that estate's tragic secrets. What my eyes imagined seeing there, if they did, was enough to haunt my dreams for years to come. Some doors to the past are better left unopened, mysteries unraveled. Whatever spirits still linger behind in that forgotten place, I'll let them keep their solitude undisturbed. I'll never forget that brisk fall day I went hiking in the state forest near my hometown. I was enjoying the solitude and the vibrant fall colors when something peculiar caught my eye. A small farmhouse nestled in a clearing deep in the woods. Intrigued, I wandered up to take a look. It was clearly abandoned, the roof sagging and the porch covered in leaves. All the windows were dark and broken. Surprisingly, the front door creaked open at my touch. Inside, everything was blanketed in decades of dust. The simple, rustic furnishings looked straight out of another century. Who had lived in this remote place, miles from any roads? In the bedroom, the remains of a quilt lay on a metal-framed bed. An ancient wedding photo hung askew on the wall. The young, smiling couple stared back across time frozen in that moment, even as their home crumbled around them. I was startled by a sudden thump from above, mice in the attic, I assumed, but as I explored further, more thumps and even scratching sounds came intermittently from the walls and floors. The entire house seemed to vibrate subtly at times. Unease crept up my spine. I entered what appeared to be a child's room, decorated with faded paper cutouts. Thump, scratch. The rhythmic sounds continued, becoming louder, more insistent. This was no mouse. I staggered back as a section of plaster fell from the ceiling, startled by the suddenness. I laughed at myself for being so easily spooked, but as I turned to leave, a floorboard creaked nearby in the hall, as if under slow, heavy footsteps. This was no settling house. My laughter died in my throat. Something was here with me. I rushed outside, heart racing. The empty clearing was still, autumn breeze whispering through the changing leaves. The odd sounds did not follow me out, but they had been real. Some invisible thing dwelt here. I hastily retreated down the trail, glancing back frequently until the abandoned farmhouse disappeared from view. I told no one of the encounter, afraid they would think me mad, but I knew the truth. Something lingered within those crumbling walls, restless and waiting. I've always enjoyed exploring the remote wooded hills around my hometown. There's something magical about being alone among the birds and trees. One Saturday, I decided to hike farther than usual, bringing along a map and a compass. After a few hours, I came to a rocky bluff. In the valley below sat a small, decrepit house, hidden in a hollow between the hills. Curious, I scrambled down for a closer look. The place seemed long abandoned. I circled the sagging porch, peering in the dusty windows. Inside was a simple one-room home, modestly furnished. Books and faded newspapers were scattered across the floor, as if the owner had left in a hurry. A noise behind made me spin around. At the edge of the tree stood a woman silently watching me. Her old-fashioned dress was filthy and torn, her gray hair in a tangled mess. 
Surprised, I asked if she lived here. She only stared, expressionless. Uneasy, I turned to leave. Glancing back, I saw her stepping silently into the brush. I hurried up the bluff, confused by the strange encounter. At home, I searched local historical records, finding no indication anyone had lived in that remote hollow for decades. The mysterious woman had seemed like a ghost haunting the abandoned house. Intrigued, I decided to return. The next Saturday, I hiked back to the hollow, entering the house to explore further. Nothing had changed from my first visit. Curiously, there was no electricity or plumbing. It was like stepping back in time. I searched for some clue as to who had lived here, finding only a tarnished silver pocket watch engraved with the initials JB. Just then, movement outside caught my eye. The same elderly woman stood in the yard, staring vacantly. I approached her slowly, asking again who she was. Up close, her eyes were clouded, as if blinded or catatonic. She mumbled incoherently, clutching her tattered dress. I noticed her bare feet were caked in mud and leaves. Growing uneasy, I left her there, swaying, and walked back home. I had to learn who she was and why she inhabited this forgotten place. Over the following week, I scoured archives, finally discovering J.B., Jacob Benton, a hermit who had lived in that hollow from 1920 until his death in the 1960s. Could this be his ghost somehow still lingering? Against my better judgment, I returned once more, descending the bluff to confront the mystery. But when I entered the empty house, something felt wrong. There was an earthy, animal smell, trails of dirt scattered across the floor. In Jacob's bedroom, the closet door now hung open. Inside, makeshift bedding lay on the floor, leaves and twigs scattered about. My pulse quickened. Someone had been sleeping here. Back outside, the yard was empty, the woman nowhere to be seen. Uneasy, I left to hike home. Had she been real at all? I now feared returning to that house, yet felt compelled to unravel its secrets. But my curiosity will remain unfulfilled. The next weekend, I searched the hollow in vain. The house and the woman had vanished without a trace, leaving only unanswered questions. I'll never forget that sunny afternoon I went hiking in the slot canyons near my hometown. As an amateur geologist, I loved exploring the mazes of red rock formations that wind through the desert landscape. On that day, I stumbled upon a small cave I had never noticed before, halfway up a secluded sandstone cliff. Against my better judgment, I decided to investigate. I switched on my headlamp and crept into the narrow opening. The cave was larger than it appeared from the outside, consisting of a network of small chambers. I ducked through the low tunnels, tracing my hand along the smooth walls that looked almost melt-formed. In the farthest chamber, an arched doorway led into pitch blackness. I paused, then stepped through into the void, my headlamp piercing the darkness. The room was perfectly round, the walls ringing with echoes. It was clearly not a natural formation. I played my light upward, illuminating a domed ceiling. That's when I saw them. Hundreds of humanoid figures carved intricately into the sandstone, covering every inch of the ceiling. I stumbled back in shock. Each figure was different. Some with large almond-shaped eyes, none looked quite human. I stood frozen, staring upward, my mind unable to process what I was seeing. These bizarre etchings would change human history if revealed. 
A scraping sound in the tunnel behind me made me whirl around. For a split second in the flashlight glow, I saw a small hairy creature crouched on all fours. Its eyes reflected the light back like an animal's. Then it scurried away down the tunnel before I could get a better look. I raced after it through the chambers, clambering back up to the cave entrance. By the time I emerged onto the cliff, it had vanished. The surrounding canyons were empty and still. I couldn't shake the image of those eyes watching me from the shadows. I had discovered something incredible and something sinister. I couldn't tell you how I knew, but in my gut, I felt it. This cave was not meant to be found. I returned home, knowing I had to keep its existence secret, at least for now. I could barely sleep that night, troubled by the encounter. What had I seen, and what were the carvings of? The next morning, I hiked back, determined to get photos of the chamber that would turn science on its head, but I couldn't find the cave entrance no matter how hard I searched the canyon walls. It had simply vanished. Over the years, I returned to the area many times, obsessively seeking the hidden cave. But the sandstone face remained a sheer, unbroken surface. It was as if the cave had never existed at all, the bizarre etchings nothing more than a fantasy. Deep down, I know the truth of what I discovered that day and more chillingly that something ancient and unearthly dwells within those lost caverns, protecting its secrets. I've never spoken publicly of the encounter until now, but the time has come to share my story, if only to warn others that some places are not meant to be found. They must remain undiscovered for the good of humanity. As an experienced backpacker and nature photographer, I've hiked hundreds of miles through remote wilderness over the years, but nothing could prepare me for the terror I experienced last week while camping alone in the Boundary Waters. I had hiked deep into the network of lakes and streams, excited to spend a few days completely immersed in nature and solitude. The first night went perfectly. I cooked dinner fireside as the sun set and then curled up in my tent listening to loons call across the lake. The next morning, I set off hiking again with my camera, hoping to photograph some wildlife. I stopped frequently to snap photos of birds, deer, and other creatures. Late in the afternoon, I came across huge, mysterious tracks in the mud along the trail. They looked somewhat human, but enormous, with only four toes. Unease trickled down my spine, but I shook it off and continued. I set up camp that evening on a scenic ridge. While boiling water for my freeze-dried dinner, the forest suddenly fell eerily silent. The birds even stopped singing. Every nerve tingled with the sense something was watching me. Glancing up, I saw a face peering from the brush. Chalk white skin, sunken eyes, and a lipless mouth gazing right at me. I shouted in alarm, jumping back. The face vanished. I grabbed a stick from the fire and thrust it toward the bushes, hands shaking, but nothing was there. I spent that night huddled by the dying fire, unable to sleep. At dawn, I discovered enormous man-like footprints circling my tent and dragging from the bushes a long trail where something heavy had been pulled into the forest. Fighting panic, I decided to hike out as fast as possible. All day, I had the creepy feeling of being followed. Twice, I heard odd whooping cries from a ridge parallel to me. They didn't sound like any normal animal. At one point, across a stream, a dead deer lay mutilated, as if flung savagely against a tree trunk. Nerves on edge, I pushed onward. I hiked hours past my usual stopping time, 
desperate to put distance between me and that thing. Exhausted, I finally made camp after nightfall in a meadow. I boiled water for dinner, but was too wired to eat. The woods were silent as a crypt. Later, drifting off to sleep, I dreamed of hearing footsteps outside the tent. Suddenly, the tent unzipped, and I awoke with a start to see a pale, grinning face staring down from the opening, empty black eyes meeting mine. I screamed and kicked out wildly. The face vanished. Heart racing, I peered outside with my flashlight. Huge, bare footprints surrounded the tent, but the night was still in quiet once more. At dawn, I packed up and practically ran the last few miles back to my truck, constantly glancing over my shoulder. Only when I was driving away did I finally relax, profoundly thankful to have escaped with my life. It was meant to be a celebration. My buddies and I were camping along the Black River to commemorate graduating high school. We'd been planning this trip for weeks, ever since the invitation to a night of beer and bonfires deep in the forest came from Jake's older brother. He knew the area well from fishing trips. That first night went perfectly, drinking and joking around a crackling fire under more stars than I'd ever seen. Sometime after midnight, I wandered away from the group to take a leak. As I was zipping up, something in the river caught my eye. A dark, massive shape cruising slowly against the current. I stared, puzzlement turning to unease. It was no overturned log or debris. This shape had a defined head and body, with what looked like several limb-like appendages trailing behind. As the moon briefly illuminated its surface, I glimpsed something scaly and slick, something very much alive. I hustled back to the fire, trying to convince myself it was just an odd shadow, but a nagging dread lingered at the back of my mind. I didn't mention what I'd seen to the others. They were pretty hammered and would have just laughed it off. Eventually, I passed out in my tent. Sometime before dawn, I woke to urgent whispers right outside the tent flap. It was Jake and some others, crouched in a circle. What's up? I asked groggily, crawling out to join them. Jake shone his flashlight toward the tree line. Huge claw marks gouged deep into the bark of several trees, sap still oozing. The gashes were far taller than any animal native to these woods could make. What the hell did this? Jake breathed. I slowly told them about the dark shape I'd seen earlier in the river. As I described it, their eyes widened with fear. We agreed to pack up camp first thing in the morning, but morning would not come fast enough. Later that night, I was roused from my tent again by whoops and chaotic laughter from the group. They were gathered at the river's edge, chucking rocks and sticks into the water. I rushed over, convinced that they were drunkenly provoking whatever had left those gashes. Stop it, I hissed but no one would listen. They just jeered and kept throwing things. Suddenly, a monstrous shape exploded from the black water, not 20 feet from shore. I barely glimpsed black, scaly skin and huge claws before it disappeared with a splash. Everyone froze, mouths agape. Let's get the heck out of here, Jake said shakily. No one argued. We began tearing down camp as quietly as possible, but it was too late. An earth-shaking roar boomed out of the darkness, followed by a splashing charge through the shallows, straight toward us. Panicked, I sprinted for the trail that led back to the cars. Glancing back, I saw a hulking creature haul itself from the water. It stood upright on two muscular legs, black scales glistening. Moonlight glinted off rows of sharp teeth in its elongated, crocodile-like snout. Heavy claws flexed at its sides as it roared again in rage. Chaos erupted. My friends screamed and fled in all direction into the trees, 
I ran mindlessly through the darkness, hearing the beast's bellows and the crash of trees as it rampaged after us. Heavy footfalls pounded the earth uncomfortably close at times. Finally, I burst from the tree line onto the gravel lot where we had parked. Other panicked friends were already diving into their cars. I jumped into the back seat of the closest one. Tires spun as we peeled out and went careening down the dirt road away from that cursed place. Gasping for breath, I looked back and saw a dark shape appear from the trees at the lot's edge. It raised its crocodilian head toward our fleeting taillights and let loose an enraged primal scream that will haunt my dreams forever. In the frantic days that followed, we learned that two of our friends were dead and another missing, presumably taken by the demon that dwells in the Black River. Efforts to find their remains came up empty. The authorities blamed wild animals, but we knew the truth and we vowed never to speak of the horror we had witnessed or to go anywhere near those woods again. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep, so we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP, and then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out, on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins, and we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head shoulders and from its forearms to its fingers it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path it had long spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end i really don't know if i was looking at nails and claws or if its skin was just stretched like that its head was pointed slightly downward and i would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam 
but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't going to just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back. But uh, w when you're done, just tell me. Because we're going to make a run for the cabin. Okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though, it was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously, she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it, but I think about it every summer.